Hi everybody, Mark Summers here. I am on the Hollywood Raw podcast having a just the best time ever. You know what we're going to talk about? How did I get Double Dare? What's in slime? And what really happened with me and Burt Reynolds? And a little bit about my new podcast, so stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome to the Hollywood Raw YouTube page. Make sure you drop a comment, like, subscribe. Do all the fun things. Follow. Follow everything. We're here to entertain you guys. What are you waiting for? Hurry up, let's go. Enjoy. Welcome to the Hollywood Raw Podcast. Mark Summers, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Adam couldn't be here today. He's not feeling so hot, but I said I will not cancel on Mr. Mark Summers. That's not happening. He was too big a part of my childhood to uh, to cancel. <laughs> Where did you grow up? No, uh, I, I am originally from Denver, Colorado, um, but then I moved out to California and I have been here ever since. I love it. You are you are here in California, correct? I am. I live up in the Santa Barbara area. Um I was sort of tri-coastal for the longest time, doing a lot of Food Network stuff, uh, mostly on the East Coast. And uh, things slowly uh, disappeared. And then when COVID hit, oh, I said, you know, why do I have all these places that I'm running to? Why don't I have one place? So we moved up to Santa Barbara. And Santa Barbara is one of the most beautiful areas. If, if people come out here to California, make sure you hit up Laguna Beach and Santa Barbara. Those are the two like most beautiful spots you can really hit up. So, Mark, I all right. I did a bit of research going into this because it's like, I know you from Nickelodeon. I know you from Double Dare, but I kind of wanted to know like the other side of Mark Summers, you know, some maybe that people don't know about. Number one, I didn't realize that Mark Summers isn't your birth name. Mark Berkowitz is actually your birth name. Is that correct? That is correct. And I woke up one morning and they said, uh, we've caught the son of Sam. His name is David Berkowitz. And my phone rang about 10 minutes later from my agent and he said, and nobody knows who you are anyway. You need to change your name. I won't be able to get you an audition anywhere. And uh, it, it freaked me out. And uh, yeah. no relation, needless to say, the guy was even adopted. But uh, nonetheless, um, the most anti-Semitic people in Hollywood are other Jewish people. And so I changed my name to Mark Summers and started to work. What can I tell you? <laughs> that is so funny. I, I had no idea. Now, okay, when you when you go and tell your parents, hey, I'm changing my 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 name, the family name, how does that affect them? Were they like, damn, or do they get it? Uh, kind of 50, 50, uh, why are you doing that? Um, and, and, uh, yet they got it, uh, career wise. I had a friend of mine, uh, his name was Howie Itzkowitz, a stand up comic. He was uh, really funny. Uh, had trouble getting arrested, changed his name to Howie Stevens, started to work like crazy. So I, it's, <laughs> it's a weird thing. I mean, there was a comedian by the name of Stanley Myron Handelman who couldn't have been more popular. I don't know how important names are. I started off as a disc jockey 100 years ago, and it used to be a one syllable first names and two syllable last names. So Mark Summers seems to work in that vein. And there was a DJ when I grew up in Indianapolis whose name was Dick Summer. I added an S to his name, and, and that's how I came up with it. So funny. It's it's always interesting to hear how people came up with their like their stage name, their performer name. I love it. When did you actually start? Like, how old were you yeah. when you started doing Double Dare? Double Dare, I was 34. Um, I thought I was not going to get a job doing what I wanted to do. In fact, I had a smoked salmon business uh, that was doing fantastic. We were in uh, Price Club uh, before, uh, you know, prior to being Costco. We were in Trader Joe's. Uh, I was selling between 80 and 100,000 pounds of smoked salmon a month. We were doing great. Um, and I thought, well, that's where my career is going. And then a friend of mine, Dave Garrison, who was a ventriloquist, got a call and said, hey, uh, some network I've never heard of called Nickelodeon is looking for a host for a show. I've never heard of Nickelodeon and I don't want to host anymore. I want to be a producer. So why don't you go instead of me? And so I didn't even think you can do that today, but um, I went into the audition. They said, Dave Garrison. I said, he's not here, but my name is Mark. Can I audition instead? They said, sure. And uh, three months later I had the job. Dang. And then did you and Dave, talk about that years later, like this was the best thing you could have ever done for my life. <laughs> Honest to God, he became a very, very successful producer. And uh, I kind of got my wishes uh, come true by doing that. They had auditioned a thousand people in New York and didn't like anybody. I was the first mm -hmm. person to audition in L.A. and uh, got three callbacks before it finally happened. And uh, just to give you the Cliff Notes version, at the end, uh, 
what had happened was it was down to me and one other person. They couldn't figure out who to select. So I suggested they put us both in a studio with kids because the, the, the conundrum was we auditioned with adults playing the part of kids and they didn't know if we could relate to kids. So I suggested mm. we do it with real kids in the studio. So they flew me to New York uh, on a Labor Day prior to uh, shooting in 86 and uh, did the other thing, the uh, same thing for the other guy. And at the end, they called me and said, you got the job. And I said, well, after looking at about 2000 people, why did you select me? And they said, well, you and the other guy were about the same. But at the end of his audition, he looked at the camera and said, uh, you guys want me to do anything else? And I looked at the camera and said, we'll be back with more Double Dare right after this. And because I threw it to commercial, they thought that was more professional. It changed my life. Wow. Just that momentary second. You probably didn't even think about it in the time either. No, it, no, I had watched game shows and grew up watching Bob Barker and all these folks. And I figured, well, you know, when you're done with something on TV, you just throw it a commercial. That's what I did instinctively. That's so cool. How many, how many times do you think you were slimed on that show? <laughs> Hundreds. We did uh, 525 <laughs> episodes. And the first 65, I never got messy. And uh, they did focus groups. And the kids said, we love the show. We love the host, but we want him to get messy. So the network called me in and said, sorry, you know, you got to start getting slimed. And, you know, as soon as the door was open, that was it. Uh, kids would say to me, if we win the obstacle course, can we slime you? And I went, oh, of course. And it just became fun. <laughs> and what, what was the slime made out of? What, what kind of concoction is that? Back in the day, it was vanilla pudding, applesauce, and oatmeal. Uh, now, uh, in our latest version of Double Dare, about four years ago when we brought it back briefly, uh, they have a company that um, just does nothing but make slime for Nickelodeon. And we went in for a day and measure the, uh, ready for this, the viscosity. Uh, how okay. thick, how thin do you want it to be? Do you want it to drip down? Do you want it to just sit there? Uh, so it's very scientific. Back in the day, it was just, you know, <laughs> let's pour some apple sauce and, and vanilla pudding together and see what happens. It, it's amazing that that is someone's full-time job to make <laughs> slime. Like, that is a career right there. <laughs> how many episodes do you think you recorded throughout your days of Double Dare? And that is with the original and the reboot. Oh, uh, with the reboot as well, about 600 uh, and a stop in the middle there for uh, 90 episodes of a show called What Would You Do that we did at Nick, but about 600 episodes of Double Dare. That is unbelievable. But what and I'm, I'm also so curious because like when I think about Nickelodeon, I think about it like crazy, wild, fun. And was it weird or great? Like on the Nickelodeon studios, like on the, the back lot, was it as wild and crazy or was it like super professional and like we just get our stuff done uh no the the first it was just wild and crazy because when we first started we were shooting at whyy in philadelphia because uh nickelodeon didn't have the money to spend to shoot it in new york so they found the least expensive studio in philadelphia and we were shooting for about twelve thousand bucks an episode which is unheard of even back back then mm -hmm. and um Nobody was kind of watching the store. Um, our exec producer, Mike Klinghoffer, and our uh, other uh, producer, uh, Dana Calderwood, and our head writer, uh, Alan Silberberg, we all kind of thought we were at a college dorm. And since there was no supervision, we kind of did whatever the hell we wanted. And the things that we got away with, uh, even now, when they, they show up on Paramount Plus, people go, I, I, I can't believe that got, got through. But, uh, but we got a lot of stuff done that uh, these days would never happen. How long did it take before like you started to be like, oh, I'm getting paid well? Because if they're doing $12,000 episodes at the beginning, I, I'm assuming you weren't exactly paid amazingly well at the beginning, but it, it takes some time and then the show became a crazy hit. When did you feel like, oh, this is awesome. Like this is a career. Well, they started me at 500 bucks an episode. So 2,500 bucks a week. I never made money like that anyway. So I thought I had died and gone to heaven. But when it exploded and we went into syndication, oh boy. Uh, my life changed uh, because to this day, I still have ownership in the show. Um, and so we took it on tour as well. And we would do uh, 20,000 seat arenas um, selling lots of merchandise uh, and things such as that. So about three years after we started around uh, 89, 90, I went, wow, this is this is a cool way to make a living. That is so cool. And I, I got to imagine that that when you have ownership, you're getting residuals for some kind because I feel like I will still turn on the TV random days and I'll see something pop up and I'm like, damn, it's one of those shows that has really lasted forever because it, it, it doesn't get old watching like kids have fun and then like the younger generation starts to get into it. It's really cool. It, it's true. And uh, when we brought it back, uh, we do international format deals. So I get to uh, share in that. Uh, the last tour, needless to say, that was uh, magnificent. 
uh, on the Paramount Plus, uh, you know, reboots constantly. So, yeah, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And uh, my agent set up a, an amazing contract, which, uh, you know, it's, it's a weird business. When I was on The Tonight Show and I got into uh, this uh, little tuffle with Burt Reynolds uh, in 1994, <laughs> um, that shows all over the world to this day and uh, the checks keep coming in. So it's it's a bizarre way to think that people can get paid for things they did 30 years ago. That that whole interaction with Burt Reynolds. I, I, okay, so question for you. What was it like for anyone who hasn't seen this? Go YouTube it because it's a pretty damn famous moment <laughs> on the, the, the Tonight Show when uh, Mark was on and Burt Reynolds was just being a dickhead for some reason. Uh, but what what happened after the taping stopped in backstage? Did you guys talk at all or like what was the outcome of that? He left. Uh, when they went to the last commercial, he just left the stage. Okay, and and Jay's, you know, well, what's going on? What's going on? You know, and and uh, so when we came back, we find out that he got in his car and, and and went home. And Jay called me the next day and said, you know, what's going on between you and Bert? And I said, like, you know, I waited my whole life to be on the Tonight Show. I was looking at. I started off a stand up comic. I was at the comedy store with Dave and Jay and Rob and all those guys. And I just thought, well, this guy's a heckler, and I'm going to respond uh, accordingly. And I had a meeting the next day after that. Uh, moments and a friend of mine steve bender who knew um bert's uh, publicist and he said do you want me to call bert's publicist and see what he thought of the whole situation i went yeah because everybody thought it was set up it was not set up it just happened and uh, bert said i was a bottom feeder of show business and i didn't respect the movie star so uh whatever bug he had up his particular part of the body who knows um but it, it once again never goes away and it's a moment that uh, will last uh, uh, forever i think yeah, it was it was weird to watch as like, uh, you know, the audience because you're like, wait, what just happened? Like, why is Bert so upset with this TV host? Like, it didn't make any sense. Like, it just kind of came out of nowhere. He was clearly had an agenda there. Um, but yeah, it was weird to watch. But hey, made for some great television all these years later. Correct. It really did. And then did that help? Uh, I mean controversy and all that kind of stuff obviously helps did it help make you more of a household name to the people that were not watching nickelodeon at the time well oh well, yeah you know i remember driving home and i called my wife and it was either the best thing in the world just happened to me or the worst thing happened i, I wasn't sure quite how uh you know it was going to play and at the time dave was beating jay every night and uh they were running promos before i even got in the car to go back home and uh so there was a huge tune in fact and it was the first time that that uh, jay beat dave um, so that was an interesting situation. And, um, yeah, it just, you know, you can't plan on that stuff. It just works or it doesn't. And, uh, I don't know whether it was the right place or the wrong place, but it certainly, uh, was impactful and, uh, it helped turn my life around and put me on the map uh, with a lot more people. God, I love that you threw the ice back on him. The water <laughs> on him. It was great. It was such a good moment. Well, thank uh, you. did do you, when you look back on on your career, do you, do you ever feel like you were like the that Hollywood typecast you because of you of working at Nickelodeon? Was it harder to get more serious jobs or different hosting jobs? Because I, I got to imagine, you know, Nickelodeon and Double Dare was huge, but then there's I'm assuming there was a moment in your life where you wanted to try something different, and that was there was that hard to do? Yeah, because uh, all the reviews or articles always started off with Kitty Show host Mark Summers. Okay. And uh, I never wanted to be a, a kid's game show host, but uh, I was 34 and wanted to keep working. And I never played it like it was a kid's show. Uh, I never said to the kids, you know, do you have a boyfriend? Uh, I just talked to them like they were grownups. And, and that seemed to work really well. But, yeah, I was afraid I was going to get typecast. I tell you, a turning point was um, uh, an exec producer of a show called uh, Scrabble at the time, uh, Bob Noah really believed in my career and I had done some announcing for him, some warm ups and various things throughout the years. And when I became a host, he called me up and said, uh, we're doing a uh, favorite game show host week on the Scrabble. Would you like to be on? We've got all these you know, great hosts been on television forever. I went, yeah. And he said, OK, well, well, we'll book you. And about 20 minutes later, the phone rang. and He said, I got good news and bad news. And I said, well, what's the bad news? He said, uh, I called NBC and they said he hasn't been on television long enough to be a favorite game show host. So absolutely not. He cannot be on that week. And then Bob thinking said, well, I want Chuck Woolery, the host to play the game. So how about if Mark hosts why Chuck plays? He goes, oh, he can host it. He just can't be on his favorite game show host. So I hosted Scrabble on NBC when Chuck Woolery played, Chuck Woolery played that week. And all of a sudden I was looked at as a guy who gee, might be able to do grown up game shows and other things. And it was a, a turning point in my life. 
now after you hosted that show would they then consider you for favorite game show host? Uh, oh, wow. That's nuts. You know, the, no the networks are always insane. Uh, probably not. I think <laughs> the guys I was on with, I was on with John Davidson and Tom Kennedy and, you know, those kind of folks who had been around for a long time. And, you know, when I got Double Dare, although I, I was 34, people thought I was a lot younger. I looked younger at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and these other guys were in their 50s and 60s. I remember auditioning early on before Double Dare and uh, at a network game show. And they said, come back when you have gray hair and wrinkles, kid. Because back then, that was the way to do it. You had to have that sort of look. And uh, Double Dare changed that. And then, you know, after I did it, you know, all of a sudden there was a guy by the name of Ryan Seacrest who looked super young and started doing shows. So there was a turning point with uh, me hosting uh, Nickelodeon that, that changed other people's lives as well as mine. Isn't that funny? Because now it's like, it's the opposite, I feel. Like, if you come in like right away with gray hair and wrinkles they go ah now we're looking for someone younger and you're like what the heck i can't win here <laughs> come true. on it's like i'm never in the right place at the right time <laughs> <laughs> oh man so back on double dare god i used to love that show so much so much um was there ever a team that was like so good that they dominated that like it wasn't even a good like it wasn't even a good episode so they just scrapped it because it's like you want to watch kind of like a good competition but if there's not a good competition would they scrap it or they'd still air that well we still aired it uh because we had to uh legally but our, our exec producers came up with something which turned out to be the last year of the show we didn't know at the time but we did a brain versus brawn competition so we mm -hmm. took the last season and took the smartest team the team that had the most points and won the game and then the team that was the best with physical challenges and ran the fastest obstacle course. And so the final episode was an hour special where we took the team and the family that was like amazing, got every physical challenge, ran the course in record time. And then we took the team that had the smartest uh, family and, and scored an insane amount of points. And uh, the brains beat the brawn team. Uh, and I guess that may uh, say a lot about uh, life in general. So uh, being intelligent, I think, may be more important than being... Uh, you know, uh, physically fit, but this team did uh, did both. And I stay in touch with these people. The Garrisons uh, live up in New Hampshire. And, you know, now the kids are in their 30s and, uh, you know, they were little at the time. And uh, it's just kind of fun to stay in touch with some of these people. That's awesome. When you guys did the reboot, um, how long did that last for? We did uh, two seasons. We did, I think, a total of like 60 episodes. And we did a uh, special exactly four years ago for the uh, Super Bowl down in Atlanta. Now, did you, was it a, the plan to do like a two year, just like a, a smaller thing or did it just not hit as much as like the first one did? Well, we can get into all sorts of conversations about that. Um, I, I was driving Nickelodeon crazy for years to bring it back and they kept saying, no, 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 no. And then they finally said, hey, your persistence has paid off. We're bringing it back, but you're not the host. And I said, well, OK, who is the host? And they said, we hired an influencer. And I said, I have no idea what that means. Uh, and so they hired a young lady by the name of Liza Koshi, who had, you know, a bazillion followers on social media, whatever. And I was exec producer and quote her sidekick and announcer and all that other kind of good stuff. And the ratings were fantastic. But just as we started uh, in our lovely business, management changed. Everybody who had been there forever got fired and the new team came in. And this is what happens in every network situation. When the new, new team comes in, if they didn't start it, get everything out of there that was there before me. And so we were doing fine ratings wise, but uh, the new team said, mm, I don't think so. So they pulled the plug and, you know, sadly that happened. We did a tour and did about uh, 70 cities in 18 months, which was a lot of fun. But I did realize that wa walking around uh, the country in your late 60s versus in your mid 30s uh, is a lot more difficult. So you're playing. I didn't play to bigger houses this time. I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, instead of playing to 20,000 seat places, we were playing to three to 5,000. But that's still a lot because I'm in the audience. I'm yeah. running back and forth and whatever. And although I'm in pretty good shape, uh, it, it is a little different at this point in my life. What, what kind of comments do you get from people that grew up watching you? Because I, I got you are have one of the most like recognizable, familiar faces because you were in everyone's childhood. So what kind of comments do you get from fans walking up to you on a normal daily basis? The fun part is when we were doing the tour, we would uh, people would pay to do these meet and greets backstage. And a lot of times it was just two grownups with no kids. And I'd say, well, where are your kids? And they go, well, hell with the kids. We just want to have fun on our own. And so it was a lot of grownups wanting to relive their childhood. And, you know, if I selected them and they got on stage, uh, they were like happy as uh, you know what and shit. So, uh, <laughs> so it was it was pretty amazing. Um, and, and that was fun. But just walking down the street uh, in New York City or wherever, 
the comments are always very, very nice. I, I tell you what's funny, though. Um, although I was at Nickelodeon from 86 to 94, I was at Food Network for 20 years, first as a host of Unwrapped, and then I did uh, exec producing of both Dinner and Restaurant Impossible. And sometimes people come up to me and say, hey, can I do a picture or can I have an autograph? And I'll say, uh, well, what was your favorite show? Was it Double Dare? And they go, what's Double Dare? They didn't even really existed. And all they knew me from was unwrapped. So that that was a wake up call as well. You know, that's crazy. Do you, do you ever get tired of talking about Double Dare? Like when you do interviews or like fans on the street, is it ever like oh, just not like can we talk about something else? It's funny you say that. Um, yeah, there was a period of time where I went, oh, God, do we really have to go through? You know, when COVID happened, I started to do too many podcasts. And I finally stopped because I kept getting asked the same 10 questions. And I thought, well, you know, it's all over the Internet now. You really don't need to ask me this stuff uh, anymore. But when we did the last tour, I actually started to realize the impact that this program had on a particular generation or two and what it meant to them. I, I grew up with a guy by the name of Soupy Sales, and Soupy was you know, everything to me as a kid and, and got to be very close with him and a good friend before he passed away. And um, so I started to get it and I appreciate it that facts, the fact that anybody even remembers. And I, I've hosted over 25 shows, uh, but the three that sort of stick out, of course, are Double Dare, What Would You Do and Unwrapped. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to have that sort of reputation. Um, you know, when I grew up in Indiana, all I wanted to do was be on television. And it was a passion that I had. And the fact that I got to actually fulfill the dreams and the fantasies uh, is pretty cool. How many people get up and go to work every day and say, I hate my job. And I always feel like I've never worked a day in my life. So I have no complaints. That's awesome. You know, and speaking of all these shows that you've hosted over time, like, what do you think is the key to being a good host? Someone that's relatable, someone that's like, you know, that people want to watch. It's exactly what you're doing right now. You listen. Uh, good hosts listen. And uh, I was a page uh, uh, at CBS and uh, Bob Barker, who was my idol uh, on Price, and I was I was a page on Price and I got to meet him. And then my first real job was a writer on a show called Truth or Consequences the last year he hosted it. And so I got to know Bob really well. And I used to watch him pick the contestants for Price is Right. And he said to me, Mark, it's not about you. Uh, the contestants are the stars. And if you make them the stars, uh, you'll be fine. And you don't have to be funny every day. If you get a joke in on Monday and maybe on Thursday, that's enough. And he said, you know who was the king of that? And I said, yeah, I know. And I think you're going to say the same person. Jack Benny was a comedian who hosted a, a sitcom. And he always played second banana to all these other people. And it made him look good, although the other people shined. And Bob took that philosophy. And I took that philosophy from Bob. And it's really worked. So throwing out all these names right now that you're saying, who do you think is the best host of all time? Wow. Uh, it, it depends if you're talking about talk or game. Uh, certainly Johnny Carson, by far uh, mm -hmm. the best talk show host, in my opinion. Um, he was just magical in so many different ways. On the game show world, you know, you got to go to Barker. Uh, longevity. Uh, he was great. Tom Kennedy, spectacular host. Always really, really good. Uh, Monty, uh, in a particular way, although Monty really only hosted one show, uh, he did a couple others that weren't terribly successful, but certainly Deal was his program. Um, and certain people have certain traits that that stand out. Uh, as I watch uh, shows these days, I find that people don't want to put in the work uh, and they don't want to listen. You know, it's not about you. It, it's about the person on the other side of the table. And as soon as you learn that you know, that motto, I think you'll be better off. And most people don't get that. So Mark, um, you know, uh, you, you were talking about how you were into stand up comedy and, you know, how much of you, uh, of you is coming through on these shows? How much of it was off script? How much of it did you just naturally improvise and threw out funny one liners? Or did these shows not give you that flexibility because they are children's shows? I had total flexibility. That's, you know, it was so funny when we did Double Dare in the newest version with uh, Liza, she got sick one day and they said to me, uh, can you fill in for her? And I said, yes. And they said, how much time do you need to rehearse? And I said, I don't need any time. I just walk up and do it. <laughs> and they said, oh, come on. And I said, no. So we went up there and, you know, I nailed it. Uh, way to go, Mark. And uh, the ratings went up 25 percent on that particular day. Uh, interesting. Um, and so when we were doing Double Dare, once again, I was a 34-year-old guy who never wanted to host a kid's show, and I wanted to do 
funny stuff. And so I was doing impressions that the kids had no idea who I was, who I was doing. I was doing impressions, impersonations of a Broadway star by the name of Ethel Merman. I was doing Henry Fonda. I was doing Ed Sullivan. And they did focus groups and they thought I was like some weird uncle or older brother or somebody. And although they may not have laughed or they laughed because it was all so ridiculous, uh, uh, when the announcer on uh, Hollywood Squares used to introduce John Davidson, and he used to go, John Davidson, and I I, uh, I started impersonating him. Well, they, they caught on to that, but the, the best moment for me was about year five. A kid raised his hand in the audience during the commercial break, and he said, can I do, the kid was about 10 years old, can I do my impersonation of Ethel Merman? I said, Okay, so we came back from break. I said, we have, you know, little Bobby here from, uh, you know, St. Louis, and he says he wants to do, uh, you know, his impersonation of Ella Merman. So we sang a duet singing, there's no business like show. And I, I knew at that point we had done something, we had broken through. And now when the people watch it on Paramount Plus, they make comments like, wow, I had no idea the show was being done on two levels, sort of like Rocky and Bullwinkle. You were making these jokes that I didn't get when I was nine, but boy, I sure understand what, what you were doing now. And, and I love that. Oh, I was, I was thinking, I think that's why they're like some of these like Pixar films are so amazing yes. is because they speak to the kids, but then there's the jokes and the funny things that speak to the parents watching with their kids. And I would say, yeah, maybe I missed half of those jokes when I was younger, but I can tell you, maybe my parents picked up on them at the time because you were uh, appealing to them as well. When we'd go out and do the personal appearance tours and the parents would come up to me and say, I watch every day for that one thing you do for us. And I thought, okay, they get it, you know? And I would sort of wink at them and, you know, do stuff, though a lot of times double entendre. But keep in mind, nobody was watching the store. And, you know, one day we, you know, we said to the kids, you can name uh, your team anything you want. And one of the team's name was the Bodacious Tatas. So, uh, what <laughs> <laughs> and the network never thought about it so what can i tell you <laughs> really N never once was there a red flag thrown on that one <laughs> no and it, when it airs to this day people go crazy how did that get through you know and we figured <laughs> well, let's see if we can get away with it so we did you know? <laughs> <laughs> now is hosting a a game show the best gig in hollywood or can you name a better gig uh yeah probably i mean say jack and uh you know all those folks who do those kinds of shows you know pad works 39 days a year and you know makes a, a boatload of money um mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean you you cannot complain uh you're happy you're helping other people you're giving them prizes and money uh what's wrong with that picture you know absolutely nothing yeah. uh, i didn't feel the pressure so much there i've had a couple shots at some talk shows and uh, to do that five days a week i mean the fact that jimmy kimmel just hit 20 years and you know jay and all those guys did it for so many years. It's hard work. It, it, if you do it right, if you prep mm -hmm. it properly and do your homework, you can't just walk in and, and you know, walk through it and, and, and phone it in. You, you really have to do a lot of work. And last time I saw Kimmel, I was at a charity event and I said, how's it going? And he said, you know. And I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, you know how hard this is. I mean, every day you've got to, you know, you got to study and get down to it because you, you look like a jackass if you don't anyway, but you want to make your guests look good. And that's why these guys are lasted as long as they do, because they, they actually work at it. And, you know, but being a game show host, yeah, it's, it's probably the best job in, in the world. Now, do, did you ever get nervous going out on stage? Like you're saying you've done, you know, I guess on the 600 shows, I don't know. Um, but did you get nervous at a certain point? Because there's all these live shows and you're in front of people, you know, it's going to air on, on television. Or did that nervousness go away after year three? Uh, no, after year six months. Um, I, it's where I feel the most comfortable. Uh, yeah. You know, Letterman used to say uh, the best part of the day is that hour he's on television and the other 23 hours suck. Um, they don't suck for <laughs> me, but, but uh, there's something magical about it. It's just where I feel comfortable. Um, I can walk on stage and ad lib and, and take charge of an audience and I get hired, you know, to MC a lot of stuff and whatever, but it's just second nature. I started as a professional magician. You know, I was a kid magician in, back in Indianapolis doing birthday parties and, you know, bar mitzvahs and dog shows and wakes and whatever I could get paid for. Um, but then I did it for a living, I worked at the Magic Castle for several years here in uh, Los Angeles. And, you know, when people say to me, how do I become a host? I just said, get out there and, and get on stage. The more comfortable you are, the better you're going to be. And the best training I ever got was I was uh, a warm-up announcer uh, for a bazillion shows in Los Angeles, uh, Star Search, Webster, What's Happening Now, Alice, Our Magazine. Uh, and I made a hell of a living before anybody knew who I was. I was making six figures asking people where they're from because you're out there 
uh, as the glue when they're doing wardrobe changes or whatever. And uh, you have to sit out there for three or four hours and keep the audience entertained. And that's where you learn how to do your craft. And, and tell people what the Magic Castle is, because not everyone knows if they're outside of L.A. what the Magic Castle is and how cool it is. So explain it from your point of view. Magic Castle is Disneyland for adults. It's a private club. You walk in. It's sort of a haunted castle. You say open sesame and this door opens up and then you walk into a room where there's a, a piano uh, with a haunted person by the name of Irma. And you can walk up to Irma, who you can't see, of course, and ask Irma to play any song and she'll play it for you. There's bars everywhere. There's a restaurant, but there's showrooms. And uh, they like to think, and most times they're correct, uh, the be best magicians in the world uh, are the only ones who are allowed to perform there. And when I first moved to Los Angeles, I was 21 years old, made it through my first audition and started performing at the Magic Castle when I was 21, did so for many years um, until I was an opening act for uh, Gallagher. And I was playing a place called The Laugh Stop in Newport Beach. And he said to me, uh, I was still Mark Berkowitz. He said, Berkowitz, come here. I said, yeah, he goes, this is Leo. You're an asshole. I said, Leo, why am I an asshole? He says, how much they pay you to cut those ropes and do those card tricks? And at the time I was making 150 bucks to open for him. He goes, that's why you're an asshole. Stand up comics get twice as much. Get rid of those props. Now, funny coming from a comedian who, who used only props, but he said, get rid of those props <laughs> and you'll get paid more money. And so I slowly weaned uh, the card tricks and the rope tricks away. And next thing I knew, I was opening for people at 300 bucks instead of 150. And it was a turning point in my life. That's awesome. Now, I, I if anyone can ever get out there, you, you got to get an invitation to the Magic Castle. It is so cool. It's right behind basically the, is it the Dolby Theater still? I yeah. don't even know what the yeah, Commons I think Theater this week is called it is. these it days. Change next week, but yeah. Yeah, I'm like, whatever, <laughs> whatever the theater is called that has the handprints in front of it at this point. Uh, but it's like right behind there. Um, and it's tucked up. It's really just a fascinating, cool place. I've been there a couple times, but really cool. Their, their up close magic room was probably my favorite. Like you were literally right next to the magicians and they're doing these sleight of hand tricks. They're just so cool. Anyway, uh, just had to throw that out there because I love that place. Nice. Um, and then uh, what I was also going to ask, because we were talking about how, you know, if you got nervous being in front of people or doing perform uh i guess hosting have you ever gotten nervous or starstruck with a celebrity like is there anyone that you met that like truly starstruck you yeah um when i was a page at cbs everybody knew that uh i was an old show business freak so uh there was an afi dinner for jimmy cagney um and so yes i got to meet jimmy cagney and the thing that was interesting about that was i had a book uh my favorite movie is yankee doodle dandy and standing next to me, this is 1974, was Don Rickles. And Don Rickles was like trembling. He couldn't believe that he was going to meet Jimmy Cagney. And he kept saying all these things. And I got Cagney to sign this uh, autograph for me. But that day, Frank Sinatra was the host. And um, <laughs> um, he was there during uh, a rehearsal. Uh, and, and so they knew I liked Sinatra. So they put me on stage with Frank. So I was standing there with my page uniform on. I was all of like 21 or 22 years old. Frank walked by me. He goes, hey, kid, as you would expect Sinatra to do. And uh, Jilly, Jilly was his, uh, not his real brother, but it was like a brother. And he owned a place in New York, a, a club that Frank used to go to all the time. And so Jilly was sitting behind me and there was a, a, a little table with an ashtray on it. Frank lights up his cigarette and he starts smoking. And he realizes the ashes are coming down. And he said to me, hey, kid, give me that ashtray. And I just sat there staring. My feet were like nailed to the, I, I, I couldn't move. And he said, kid, ashtray. And I sat there with this ridiculous look on my face and I, I just couldn't move. And finally, Jilly got up and grabbed it. He said, Frank said he wanted the ashtray. And he went over and got it. <laughs> and that was the one moment where I went, oh my God. Uh, I never thought I would be that guy, but I was that guy because I couldn't believe I was in the presence of uh, Frank Sinatra. I mean, that's, that's a pretty damn good one to be starstruck by. Frank Sinatra. Not everyone can say that. That's cool. I, I think it, what I also I took away from that story was that Don Rickles actually could be nervous to meet someone. Like, I just, I can't even picture Don Rickles ever being nervous in his life. So it was interesting. I love that. It was really, and you know, and I had a, the opportunity to go to dinner with Frank Sinatra's first wife, uh, Nancy Sr. And uh, we go to a place called Guido's, of course. And when we walked in, they were playing Sinatra music. And she said, uh, can I uh, can I order for you? You know, like, whatever you want. And uh, she said, ask me whatever you want. And I said to her, uh, OK, if I go, you know, 
overbound, just tell me. She goes, no, you can ask me anything. So I said, uh, why did you never get married after you and Frank divorced? She said, honey, where do you go after Frank? He was the best. And she told me stories that when he was carrying on the affair with Ava Gardner or whatever, he would come to her house, lay on the couch. She would make pasta in the kitchen. And they had this relationship that never went away, that they raised the kids together. She said, we never made a move uh, with those kids unless we just discussed it. So he never, uh, you know, sort of left uh, his first love uh, from, you know, down, down the street in the neighborhood. And I was always impressed with that as well. Hmm. So interesting. So interesting. You've had a crazy life, sir. I must say the people that you've met. So you've got this new podcast that's coming out um, February 13th. It's called uh, Mark Summers Unwraps. Tell me about because I I was listening to the trailer. You've got a lot of people coming on. It seems like you've done a lot of work already to this point, doing interviews and chatting with people. Tell me, number one, the concept of the podcast and then who you're having on. Well, I never wanted to do a podcast because um, I, I just thought there's so many people out there already ahead of me. How am I ever going to break through? And this company that got behind me, uh, I believe, said, I'm telling you, you can do this. And I realized uh, it's going to be a lot of work. So after three or four requests, I said, OK, let's do this. Uh, but, you know, I kind of need to do the show that I want to do. And they were sure, go do what you want to do. And everybody kind of needs a theme of sorts. And so my theme was overcoming obstacles. Um, why is it when you turn on a, a TV show or you watch a movie or go to a Broadway show, you go, boy, that guy who was starring in that thing, they're the luckiest people in the world. And you go, no, they're not, they're not lucky. They work their asses off to get where they're going. And the question becomes why when people have obstacles, some people jump over the wall, some people figure a way to go around it. And other people go, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. And they retreat. And, you know, uh, I was 34 before I got my first show. Um, I've had cancer. I was in a car accident where I broke every bone in my face. Um, I've had obstacles to overcome myself. And so that was what we addressed. Our first guest is Anthony Ramos. Anthony, uh, I met um, after my car accident and uh, uh, somehow getting away from death twice. I decided uh, I want to fulfill my dream of being on Broadway. And so uh, I contacted the guy who was a, a producer and he put me in summer stock that summer, 11 years ago. And he asked me if I wanted to play uh, Vince Fontaine in Greece. And I said, yes. And so there was this young kid, about 17 years old, who would show up early, was amazing during rehearsals, amazing during the show and didn't leave until everybody else left. And we all said, this guy's going to be big someday. Well, the next thing you know, he's in Hamilton and now he's starring in every movie uh, that you could imagine. <laughs> But now um, I've known this guy since he's 17. He's maybe 27, 28 now, maybe 29. And um, I know him well. And I got him to come on and open up about a lot of stuff. And uh, there was one question I asked him where he, he paused for about two minutes before he even answered it. And, and he gave me a very truthful answer. And that's what we're looking for. And so he nailed it. Uh, Guy Fieri, of course, I have to have on. Um, I was hosting Food Network Star when he became who he is now. And uh, we've been best friends since that moment. And so uh, it was fun to have him on. Gabriel Iglesias, uh, Fluffy. Um, uh, I love stand-ups because it was my early, uh, you know, it was my roots. And so he opened up and told us a lot about his mom, his dad. Al Roker was on, uh, Mike O'Malley, who I've known for 30 years. Uh, and when people say, you know, who's the most successful person that came out of a Nickelodeon? I would say it's Mike O'Malley. Uh, he's acted in movies. He's written and produced so many television shows. He starred in many TV shows. He is so creative, so smart. Um, and so I like to have people on uh, that are intelligent and that have a point of view and that have overcome obstacles to get where they are. And I think it hopefully will inspire people. And you're going to give him the title over Ariana Grande? <laughs> Who was my neighbor until a few weeks ago, and then she moved. Um, <laughs> what is what is that like being a neighbor with Ariana Grande? Uh, you know, what can I tell you? In my neighborhood, it's it's so bizarre, the people who live 
around me that you don't even think about it. I mean, I have, I'm, you know, I don't want to be a name dropper, but, you know, I have lunch every Wednesday with Dennis. Drop Miller. those names, Mark <laughs> Summers. Let's hear it. I, Dennis Miller and I have become best friends. We have lunch every every week together and talk about the smartest human in the history of the world. When you sit and have lunch with Dennis, I need a thesaurus, an encyclopedia, a dictionary, <laughs> his frame of references. I get 72% of the time. And then I write things down, go home and look it up. Um, because he just, he's brilliant. He should be on something because his, uh, his irreverence and his point of view is, is just spectacular. What, what are parties like in your neighborhood? Cause I got to imagine people are throwing some good parties. Are you hearing music late into the night? I, I don't go to parties. Um, no, I, but I, do you hear them in the neighborhood? Yes, I do hear them. I do hear them. Uh, but I, I don't go, I run into people, you know, we were having dinner a couple weeks ago and I, you know, there was Carol Burnett and you go, Oh my God, that's, that's, I was a page that's on cool. her show and you know, there she is just turning 90, I think, which is hard to believe. Um, so it, it's a fun place to live and, uh, you know, but here's the nice thing about where we live. Nobody bothers anybody. You know, nobody walks up to it. even when the tourists are in town. They kind of give them their space, which I think is nice, as opposed to, you know, being in Los Angeles and being attacked. And and I love going to New York because uh, I'll be walking down Sixth Avenue and people go, hey, Summers, hey, Nickelodeon guy, hey, Double Dare guy. And then I get my favorite. Hey, Summers, you're an asshole. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you got to love it. What can I tell you? <laughs> I love it, man. Well, I'm I'm excited for your new podcast series. I think, um, you know, just by the names that you've already got on, I think that's cool. Who Who is the one person that you want on that you have not locked down yet? Well, there's a boatload of those. I would say Tom Hanks. Um, I would okay. love to get him on. Uh, I when when Spielberg had a, a, a company and he produced one game show and I was a host of it. It was called Majority Rules. And he used to call me the fake Tom Hanks. He said, my voice and Tom's are exactly the same. They're nowhere near the same. We don't sound anything alike. <laughs> uh, why he called me that, I have no idea. But anyway, I've always wanted, I've never gotten a chance to meet Hanks. He's probably the one guy that's uh, escaped me. He was doing a Broadway show. And my way of getting to people is by FedExing them. Uh, and it generally opens up doors. And I FedExed him backstage and whatever, but he, he never responded. So somehow, some way, I guess Tom Hanks would be the guy I'd really want to talk to. Yeah, that would be a huge interview. That would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. How really about you? Fun. Who would well, you want to interview that you haven't? Well, we've we've wanted Tori Spelling for a very long time. <laughs> I just better? think that she has such a, a fascinating life. Yeah. Growing up in, you know, in TV royalty and, you know, being a, a TV star herself. So we, we have been on a crusade to get Tori Spelling. We, we really want her. Um you know, because here's the thing for me, it's not about like the biggest stars in the world, because a lot of the biggest stars in the world, they don't they don't open up. They don't tell the real story because they kind of have like they're prepped, you know, and like yes. they're guarded. Yes. I think people that have lived fascinating lives, that to me is almost more interesting. And so I think that's why we we just recently got. um Tara Reid on and I think she's had such a fascinating crazy life and she was someone we've wanted on for a very long time I'd love to have Snooki I don't know there's just there's people out there that I, I find their lives so different and unique and I want to talk to them about their lives well it's, so you guess, get to these people the publicists can be pains in the ass um tell me about it, okay. it it's to get it, Gabriel you, Iglesias on was a nightmare Okay, his his surroundings of publicists and agents and managers wouldn't let me get near him. And I said, yeah, he was on Double Dare. I pied him. He said it was the best day of his life. Do me a favor. Just ask him. And the phone rang two yeah. minutes later and said, Gabe wants to do the show. I went, I knew he was going to want to do the show. But, you know, <laughs> they say no all the time before they even go to the talent. And it's Dude, beyond it's... frustrating, you know. One day I had a publicist 100%. who I found out who I fired. And here's why I fired him. I'm walking down the street one day and a guy comes up to me. He goes, hey, I'm sorry you can't uh, MC our charity event next week. And I went, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you know, we're doing this big fundraiser. And we called your publicist and he said that you weren't available. I said, I'm 100% available. So I called the guy, Frank. And I said, Frank, uh, did you get a phone call for me to host this event? He goes, yeah, but that's beneath you now. I said, you're fired. Okay, those choices aren't yours. Those are mine. You're supposed to tell me what it is. And then I make the decision, not you. Yep. And so he went bye-bye. And I think this is the problem. All these uh, publicists try to well, earn their money. And the reality of it is, you know, they're getting in the way half the time.
Well, it's the, the gatekeepers. And I think a lot of publicists, unfortunately, are losing their power because of like social media. Yeah. You know, like it, everything had to go through them for so many years. It was just what happened. So, you know, if uh, Us Weekly wanted a comment, they'd have to go to the publicist, publicist talk to the star, the star then, you know, and it would all be revealed through them. Now a celebrity can just go onto Twitter and say whatever they want and there's no publicist needed. So I feel like a lot of publicists are fighting to keep their, their role in in Hollywood. And yeah, they, it's, it's so many times that I'm like, I reach out to people that, that are like my personal friend, but I'm, I'm trying to do like play the role of I'll reach out to the publicist, do the whole thing. And then eventually I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to reach out to them and <laughs> go around the publicist because it's too much of a pain. It is. And it, the best thing is social media. I hate social media, but I love social media because uh, you can get to people through direct messaging. And if they watch their yeah. stuff, um, I, I am a big fan of the CBS uh, morning show. And I love everybody on there, but I like Tony and I, and I love Nate. And so I direct message them, both of them. And uh, next thing I know, I'm having lunch with them in New York uh, because they were nice enough to respond and they were fans growing up. That's the other thing. I have that little magical thing. I figure out how old these people are and if they grew up watching me and then generally they respond, you know, pretty darn quick because <laughs> they're more excited to have lunch with me apparently than I am with them. But um, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of a little thing that you can do. And I find out that through social media and through FedExing, I've gotten it just about everybody I've ever wanted to get to. And it's a little magical trick that I use and I'm sharing it with everybody out there now. I love it. Well, Mark, good luck on uh, your, your podcast. And for anyone who wants to check it's called Mark Summers Unwraps. Uh, you can go wherever you download your podcast. Check it out there. He's got quite a lineup. Um, and if you want to listen to the teaser, he's you can kind of hear little bits and pieces of uh, some of the future guests. Now, is this a weekly podcast or monthly? What is It's how weekly. You, uh, we, we've shot a bunch of them already. And uh, now that the word's out, the uh, phone's ringing. People saying, well, why don't you have me on your show? So uh, in success, I guess we'll get to do this for a long time. And that would be a lot of fun. Once again, it beats working, you know. Awesome. Well, good luck with all that. You can check out Mark Summers uh, on IG at Real Mark Summers. You can check him out on social media and uh, listen to his podcast. And thank you, buddy, for stopping by. Appreciate and thank it. you. Uh, I, I say this uh, sincerely. Uh, you're great at what you do. You know, I've done thousands of these things. And uh, very rarely do I get to talk to somebody as good as you. So congratulations to you as well, sir. Well, thank you. That comes. That means a lot coming from you. I appreciate that. I mean it. All right. Well, that was fun. Very weird doing a podcast without Adam. Um, but nonetheless, we made it through. We did it. You know, that was funny because Mark Summers was such a big part of my childhood. At least a lot of people who are like my age used to watch Double Dare every day or... I don't know if it was every day. Now that I think back, it was it once a week show? I don't even remember, but I just remember, I feel like it was always on, and I feel like I watched so many damn episodes, probably wasted half my childhood watching episodes of Double Dare, and um, fun to talk to people like this. I, I like, you know, I, I said it to Mark, it's, it's not about talking to the biggest stars in the world, it's about talking to interesting people with amazing stories and life experiences, and I think that's what I like about having these random celebrities on with... Uh, you know, maybe you haven't heard uh, of Mark in a little bit, but, you know, that's that's what makes our podcast beautiful. And, um, yeah, I was listening to the teaser for his. It sounds interesting. So go check it out if, if that, you know, if you're a fan of Mark's and you want to hear from stories from like Al Roker and stuff. So uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much. Uh, I hope Adam will be joining us for the next episode, which he better be. Um Make sure you follow us on social media at Hollywood Raw. Make sure you join our podcast group, our podcast group, Ugh. our Facebook group off the record. It's a private Facebook group. It's where we join to chat about everything going on in entertainment news. People are constantly keeping me updated with all the breaking news. I'm trying to post things in there. We kind of get feedback, listen to you guys, respond to you guys. If you guys have questions for us directly, that is the place to hit us up. Um, and then make sure, please, to go leave us a review. It's the best thing you can do for us. Go to iTunes, find our Hollywood Raw page, scroll to the bottom, leave five-star review, uh, say what you like or what you love, or you can even say what you don't like. Just give us five stars um, so we can improve. And, uh, yeah, it's the best thing you can do for us. You can find Adam at Adam Glenn. You can find me at Dax Holt on all the social media platforms. And we will see you guys next time. Bye. What's up, guys? If you liked that video, there's plenty more that came from. Make sure you like, subscribe, hit the bell so we can just feed you all the goodness daily. Hurry up. Come on. Let's go.